feel like you're waiting for something. <laughs> Good morning. Welcome to First Reform Church. Thanks for coming to worship God this morning uh, together. It's, it's a blessing to be able to come together uh, and worship Him. Uh, good morning and welcome to everybody watching at home through TV or online. We're glad you're able to join us. To any visitors that we have here, we're glad you're here as well. Uh, if you have any questions, you can pretty much talk to anybody in the back, but uh, for specific questions, we have an information booth, and there's always someone there that would love to help you out. Uh, we have two third-party announcements this morning, uh, the first being from Mary Lou Rathel. So Mary Lou, would you come on up? There we go. Uh, and so as she comes up, by way of reminder, it's a critical part. I'm just glad I didn't get asked to wear that. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, but don't forget to take your bulletins home, read the rest, or you're all up to date on what's going on. Hi, everybody. This is just for the ladies. We're going to have a, a special event just for you. We just want to invite you to the Blessings Bunko and Boas event that will be held Friday evening, November 2nd, from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m., right in our fellowship hall. Our theme for this event is Count Your Blessings, and this is a totally free event, and will be a fun time of fellowship, playing a modified bunko game, and even includes a boa to wear for each of you, just for fun. And the sign-up table is in the back. All ages are welcome, and hope you all will be there. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Kyle One Egg. This is my wife, Janie, and we are uh, partners with this, this awesome congregation. If you haven't met us, we'd love to meet you. Uh, we're, we're missionaries, and so we work with Athletes in Action at UW-Madison, and we're just back in town for a birthday party this weekend, and so we are just really excited to be able to come back. We love the opportunity to come back and just say thank you. Thank you for partnering with us through giving, through prayer, through encouragement. Um, a couple of the things as we start our second year on campus at UW-Madison, uh, we're just thankful for the opportunities to work with Badger teams, with the athletes and coaches, uh, doing Bible studies. The second year that we start there is, I feel like we got our feet under us a little bit more, but we uh, just recognize that building relationships and trust takes time. And so if you just continue to pray for that, uh, we've seen a lot of awesome things happen. One of the highlights in the last couple of weeks is we saw um, 12, 13, I think 12 students ask for a Bible. They don't even own a Bible. And so we had the privilege and an opportunity to come alongside them, giving them the Word of God, and just coming alongside them and just sharing how they can grow in, in their relationship with God through that. So that's been a huge highlight. Um, Janie's been doing a lot with our interns as well. You can just quick share about that. And, and again, thank you for the opportunity to come back and worship with you this morning. Yeah, my main ministry is our three kiddos. AJ's nine, Liesl six, and George is three. He is very much curious, George. Um, so my hands are full of good things, but I also am privileged that um, we have two young women, Colette and Sarah, who have just recently graduated from college, one from Eau Claire and one from UW-Madison. They were former athletes and have um, been investing the last year or two in working with us, and so I'm in part of their training and development and making sure that they've got somebody coming alongside them as they're going through their curriculum, which is like teaching them how to lead Bible studies, how to disciple someone one-on-one, -on -one, how to have those initiating conversations of sharing your faith. So that's kind of my main role, um, our kiddos, and then Sarah and Colette. So I have a nice note here from Toby to stand up, and it's greeting time. So shake hands, give a fist bump, high five, whatever you're comfortable with this morning.
This is our uh, this is our Silver Birch band that we have. Uh, we're going to be leading high schoolers, mostly high schoolers, leading worship out at the Junior High Silver Birch Retreat in a couple of weeks. Uh, so it's exciting to be able to to do that. Uh, but keep in mind, we're leading, we're practicing to lead worship for 250 some junior hires. So kind of remember that time, maybe less of the awkward time and more of the exciting time. Uh, and so let's sing this together. Let's start with "How Great Thou Art." song we have really ties into what we're going to be hearing about today as we think of pictures of the kingdom and one of those great and amazing pictures is forgiveness um, and this was a huge song at Silver Birch last year as we sang it and these junior hires crying out uh, and singing to our great God how amazing it is that we do not take on the penalty for our sin but death was arrested by Jesus when he rose again let's sing death was arrested
Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains. My orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested, Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new now. Life begins with you. Released from my chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom. of my dad and he called me his friend oh, that's when death was arrested and my life began oh your grace so free washes over me you have that we can worship you this morning free from our sin, God, in the forgiveness that you have given us through Jesus Christ, through his life, through his death, and his resurrection, God. Thank you that that pierces us to our very cores, and we can come and sing boldly of your love and your forgiveness, not that it would stay within ourselves, God, but that it would go out from here, God, that it would ring out like it rings out of our voices, and others would hear of your great love. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. You may be, have, may be seated. I want to draw your attention to the screens where our October memory verse is found. Like usual, we'll say the reference, the verse, and then we'll go back to the reference. Psalm 66, 5. Come and see what God has done. How awesome his works in man's behalf. 
Psalm 66, verse 5. Kids, you can be dismissed to the house of praise, so you can head right on up. Have a great time. Uh, I invite you to join me in prayer. God, we give thanks for the mighty works that you have done on our behalf. We thank you for every sunrise and every sunset and for the time in between that you've watched over us while we go about our daily activities and even while we sleep. Thank you for this day, a day that you in your wisdom have set aside for us to gather to worship you. In our time of worship, help us to set aside the things that would distract us so that we're able to keep our focus on you. And as we prepare to celebrate communion this day, we take a moment in silence to confess to you the things that we have done which have not been pleasing in your sight. Father, thank you for forgiving our sins. Thank you for setting us free. Set us free so that we can be faithful servants in your kingdom this week. And accept our prayers on behalf of others. We lift to you Carrie Creer and Gary Hesslink as both of them remain hospitalized. Lay your hand of healing upon them. May they know that you're with them. We ask for healing for Jacob and Dylan Navis as they recuperate from surgery at home. And we pray for Brett and Diane as they care for them in their time of recovery. We lift to you Dan Hunick with his weekly follow-up treatments for cancer. Pray, Lord, that those treatments would be effective with only a minimum of side effects. We pray for renewed strength and energy for Fred Preter and for Larry Opkenorth. And for Tom Horn, we pray that his kidney dialysis would continue to go well, that you would enable him to meet the health challenges that he faces each day. And Father, we give thanks that Paul Rivelli's pain has lessened over time, but we pray, Lord, that you would grant healing to the point that he doesn't even need to take any pain medication. We ask for continued healing for Dave Hilblink, as well as patience for him as he awaits further surgery in a few weeks. And we pray, Lord, for your blessing upon Dylan and Heather Bowden, Uh, who were married yesterday. God, help them to honor you with their marriage. We pray for the leading of your spirit for us as a congregation as we go through the process of nominations and the selection process for those who will serve as elders, deacons, and caregivers. God, prepare those that you're calling to serve in those respective capacities. We pray for our nation. We pray for an end of all the divisions in our nation and help us as your followers to be examples of peace and reconciliation to those around us. Help us to model to the world what it means to love our neighbor as ourselves. We pray for Kelsey DeBeast and her work with World Team in Spain. We pray, Lord, that the offerings this month, the special offerings, will encourage her in her work. And we pray for Kyle and Janie in their work with Athletes in Action on the campus of the University of Wisconsin. God, guide them as they build relationships with new students and as they deepen relationships with returning students. We give thanks for the large number of freshmen who are participating in large group gatherings and who are expressing an interest in knowing you personally and even asking for Bibles. God, give Kyle and Janie wisdom as they seek to resource athletes around the state of Wisconsin as they seek to grow in their faith and share their faith with other athletes. And we also pray for their son, George, 
as he has some considerable speech delays, God use the therapy that he's uh, getting to help with his speech delays. Father, meet each of us this morning, wherever our point of need might be. Equip us for the work that you'll have in store for us to do this week. Hear our prayers. We lift it to you in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Now you have the opportunity to worship God with your offerings. I would invite you to pass the friendship register down the aisle and back again. And Campbell's going to lead us with their ministry music.
Oh God, we come because we believe. We believe in your goodness. We believe in your mercy. We believe in your grace and your power. And we come, oh God, in gratitude and thanksgiving because that we can believe in you and what you have done for us and to us. So we bring these gifts as a symbol, as a sign of giving ourselves to you. In your great love and in your service, we come. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. God's word for this morning comes to us from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18. We'll be reading verses 21 through 35. This is the good news of Jesus Christ. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him, and as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and children and all his possessions and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay me what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused, and then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in his anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. This, this is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Praise be to Christ. Amen. Have you ever played a prank on somebody? (laughs) I'm seeing a few mischievous grins out there, so I'm guessing that a few of you for sure have done this. You've played a prank on somebody. Now, there's nothing wrong with a harmless little prank done in fun, but what sometimes happens when that begins? What happens sometimes when the pranks begin? Does it end with one harmless prank? Or does someone think this? right? Payback time. Oh, fine and well, you got me, but payback time is coming, right? That's what we tend to think. Now, I had thought about, you know, recounting a few pranks, because I've known to do a few myself that I've been involved with, but I thought now probably best to leave those out of the sermon this morning. But what happens often when we do get caught up in this prank mentality when it doesn't end. 
we don't just pay back to get even, right? It'd be one thing we'd say, you know, we like to say, well, I'm going to get even. But usually our mind's saying, well, I'm not just going to get even because I'm going to play a prank back that's going to be just a little bit better. I'm going to pay back with a little bit of interest as well, right? Because my prank's going to be just a little bit better. Maybe embarrass you just a little bit more. The problem that happens often in this, what becomes a cycle is, as the interest grows, so does the hurt. Until finally we find somebody's not seeking just payback. It's more about revenge. Right? And then it can turn ugly. That's when we find ourselves in a cycle, in a situation where problems really begin to surface and things get out of control. And we forget how it all started. And we forget that we've each played a part in this cycle, and we forget that we are both fallen, sinful creatures, flawed, each of us, flawed. And then we start to say things like, well, you just need to forgive. And we have a hard time with that. Because we think we need to get even first before we, well, once I get them back, then I'll forgive. Once the score is settled, then I'll forgive. And we try to put limits on forgiveness. How does that work? We'll even say, well, I'll forgive when he says, I'm sorry. And the other person saying, I'll forgive when he says he's sorry. We put these limits, requirements on forgiveness. And I have to wonder if that's what's going through Peter's mind when he comes to Jesus with this question. See, Jesus has just talked about how to restore somebody from the church when they've sinned. He's talked about that process that we hear in Matthew 18 of going to them personally when they've sinned against you, how you're supposed to help restore them, you know, confronting them on the sin and love. And if they don't listen, you bring a brother or sister along with you. And if they don't listen to the two of you, then you can bring the church involved. That whole process for restoring them. Peter's kind of changed that. He's thinking about not so much them now as he is himself, right? His question is, how many times do I have to forgive someone when they've sinned against me? He's talking about me now. How many times do I have to forgive someone when they have sinned against me? And I'm thinking Peter felt pretty gracious, let's say pretty generous when he said seven times is seven times enough i mean surely you know once or twice is really enough but seven times that's truly has to be more than enough and i mean if we think in our society how we tend to think you know we're along the lines of you know fool me once shame on you fool me twice shame on me now how many times do we have to forgive peter said Now, there's a little bit of scholarly debate over the number that's given. 77 is what's in our scripture. Other scripture versions will say, and maybe yours had it in there, to say 70 times 7. Maybe that's what you're used to hearing. Either way, you know, 77 or 490, who's going to be able to keep count that high? I mean, to think about... That answer, I wonder what the look on the disciples' face, Peter's face, when they heard 77 or 70 times 7. Either way, who's going to keep that ledger? Are you going to keep a ledger every time 
up to 70? When do you come to the point where you just say it's way too many to count? We'd probably say that after yeah, maybe three or four or five or six. It's just too many to count. The number is really not important for the number's sake. The size of it tells us much. Jesus then goes into the parable. The parable, as he talks about the kingdom of heaven, could be compared to a king who's settling accounts. This is an interesting parable, and again in this parable, if we're not careful remaining with the focus, we could get a little out of sorts that suddenly, as we think about God as king here, wondering a little bit about a God who's going to sell off this man and his family. Let's not read too much into what's being said here. The kingdom of heaven is compared to this king who's settling accounts, and he's got a slave that owes a debt. Now, it wasn't uncommon in that day for slaves to use the master's assets, property, to go ahead and make an income and then return profits, a portion of that, to the master. What happened, though, sometimes is, you know what? Not every venture turns a profit, right? And this guy... Well, he's way over his head. Again, scholars like to argue about the numbers here. Some talk about over 15 years worth of daily wages that he owes. Other sources even talk about a million laborers having to labor to make up what he owes. Well, we get the main point, right? This debt is enormous. Basically, what it's telling us, this debt isn't payable. And yet, what does he plead? Be patient with me. Are you kidding me? Be patient? There's no way that you can ever repay this debt. And the master, the king, forgives the debt. That slave leaves forgiven. A great debt. Unbelievable. Can you imagine if your banker said to you, you know what, don't bother. Your mortgage is taken care of. It's paid off. How big would your smile be? You don't have this debt anymore. It's gone. Those school loans you owe? Forget it. Whew, right? Let's start skipping and singing hallelujah. Goes out and runs into another slave who owes him a small debt. Amounts to, again, they say about 100 days wages. So not minimal, but compared to what he owed, insignificant. Easily repayable. grabs him by the throat. Notice the sharp difference. Grabs him by the throat and demands his payment. Repay what you owe. And he gives the same answer. Be patient with me, and I will pay you. Replies to him that he will pay him a debt that has every chance of being repaid based on amount. We don't know anything about character in this situation, but based on amount, every chance of being repaid. And then he has him thrown into prison until he can pay the debt. What kind of logic is that? I mean, start thinking just logically, not just emotionally. Obviously, he's reacting emotionally in anger, but logic is not there at all. How is he going to pay the debt if he's in prison? How is he going to earn any money to pay this payable debt if he's in prison and unable to work? The vast difference 
in these two is what we're to notice between the king and the slave. To notice the difference that we have, the anger that we see here in the servant compared to the mercy of the king. Why is it that we can sometimes be this way? Why do we struggle with forgiveness? Why is it so hard for us to not keep a ledger about those who've sinned against us and what they've done? Why is it we think that they need our version of whatever punishment they deserve or us to be made even with them or us how to somehow pay them back even worse than what we experience from them in order to forgive. Because that's not what this story from Jesus is saying at all. Because the king is forgiving a debt that is unpayable. Forget the amounts. Just realize what's being said. The king is forgiving a debt that is unpayable and calling us to be that same way. Calling us to live within that kind of kingdom of mercy where forgiveness is a part of it. That's what forgiveness is about. Literally, forgiveness means to pay a debt, the repayment of a debt or a debt forgiven. A debt foregone in this situation. Let go. The claim to it relinquished. Why do we have such a hard time letting go? Why do we want to hold on to it? Because that's what we're doing. We're not hurting the person who hurt us by holding on to that, are we? Nelson Mandela says resentment is like drinking poison and then expecting or then hoping that it will kill your enemies, right? Makes no sense. Holding on to resentment, holding on to the hurt, holding on to our anger, it's only poison in our own lives, only lives within us theologian and author who wrote about forgiveness often, Louis Smeeds, says this, to forgive is to set a prisoner free and discover that the prisoner was you. It's to set ourselves free. That's what Jesus is trying to teach Peter, it's not about keeping ledgers. It's drop your pencils and put the ledgers away. Leave the justice to God in a sense. And, and no, folks, I'm not talking about here earthly senses of justice and, and laws and punishing. For, we're talking about this greater thing of the spiritual kingdom of forgiveness and salvation. It's what we come here to sing about. It's what we come here to worship about. It's what we come here to celebrate this morning in the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus Christ. It's forgiveness. That we are forgiven. That we have an unpayable debt. And it's taken care of. And we have to find a way to live in that same grace because that's what I believe is being shared with the king. And he hands the man over to be tortured afterwards. To me, it's an image of him saying, in a sense, you don't want to live in this kingdom. You're going to live in your kind of kingdom with your ledger and your anger and your hate. And it's going to be awful. And God's calling us to live in this kingdom of grace and forgiveness that can set us free. 
There's a lot of great images of people who found the power of forgiveness. I could go on a long list of people like Corey Ten Boom. One I wanted to point out was, and I think I may have talked about him before, is Louis Zamperini, a U.S. person who was Italian and made fun of a lot as a kid. He served in World War II. And we could go a long time recounting the life. You may have read the book or seen the movie Unbroken, recounting the details of Louis's life and service in the military, but most of all his time spent in the prisoner of war camps in Japan. And the unthinkable things that he endured at the hands of his captors. Unthinkable. Unimaginable. And when he came back from his time in those prison camps after the war was over, his life was a mess. Regaled a hero and all of that, life should have been great. But he lived with those demons of hatred and anger. You see, as a kid, he had learned as he got teased all the time that he always sought to get even. Now he found himself in a position where getting even, he seemed powerless. And he lived with it. And even though his life was coming together afterwards and he was married and things seemed to be going well, he had a problem. And that problem led him to alcohol. And that problem started a spiral in his life and it was falling to pieces. His wife was ready to divorce him. And she went to a Billy Graham crusade and came back and said, I'm not going to pursue the divorce, but I want you to come with me to hear him speak. And as at one of those crusades that Louis Zamperini gave his life, he knew who Jesus Christ was. He was raised in the church, but never had really taken Christ into his heart and his life. Never really accepted what that meant. And when he did, he found the truth of what he says right here. I think the hardest thing in life is to forgive. Hate is self-destructive. If you hate somebody, you're not hurting the person you hate. You're hurting yourself. It's a healing. Actually, it's real healing. Forgiveness. Because what he found in that moment is he said he knew right away that he no longer needed alcohol because he had forgiven his captors, even the one who was the most cruel to him. Forgiven. And he went back to Japan to find each of them and speak to them about that forgiveness. Forgiveness sets us free. Sets us free. How many times am I to forgive? As often as it takes that you may live in the freedom of God's grace and love forgiveness theologian Reinhold Niebuhr leaves us with this thought forgiveness is the final form of love it's what Jesus did for each one of us so that as we gather around this table We recognize that each one of us, each one of us has hurt somebody. Each one of us has a reason to be saying I'm sorry to someone. So each one of us should be able to come and forgive as we have been forgiven. Let us come to the table. And celebrate what Christ has done. Let us go to God in prayer. Almighty God, we come recognizing that we are forgiven. What a great power there is to know that we are set free, to know that truth of being forgiven, and to know that truth. That in you we can turn over our hurts 
our anger, our desire for payback and revenge, and let it go and forgive. In you there is strength to do that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Listen to these words as they prepare us to celebrate the sacrament together. Beloved in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Supper which we are about to celebrate is a feast of remembrance, of communion, and of hope. We come in remembrance that our Lord Jesus Christ was sent to the Father into the world to assume our flesh and blood and to fulfill for us all obedience to the divine law, even to the bitter and shameful death of the cross. By his death, resurrection, and ascension, he established a new and eternal covenant of grace and reconciliation that we might be accepted of God and never be forsaken by him. We come to have communion with the same Christ, who has promised to be with us always, even to the end of the world. In the breaking of the bread, he makes himself known to us as the true heavenly bread that strengthens us unto life eternal. In the cup of blessing, he comes to us as the vine in whom we must abide if we are to bear fruit. We come in hope, believing that this bread and this cup are a pledge and a foretaste of the feast of love of which we shall partake when his kingdom has fully come, when with unveiled face we shall behold him, made like unto him in his glory. Since by his death, resurrection, and ascension, Christ has obtained for us the life-giving spirit who unites us all in one body, so are we to receive this supper in, in true love, mindful of the communion of saints. All those who are part of Christ's family, who profess him as Lord and Savior, are welcome at this table. Come, for all things are now ready. Pray with me. Let us lift up our hearts and give thanks to the Lord our God. Holy and right it is and our joyful duty to give thanks to you at all times and in all places. O Lord, our creator, almighty and everlasting God, you created heaven with all its hosts and the earth with all its plenty. You have given us life and being and preserve us by your providence. But you have shown us the fullness of your love in sending into the world your son, Jesus Christ, the eternal word made flesh for us and for our salvation the precious gift of this mighty Savior who has reconciled us to you, we praise and bless you, O God. With your whole church on earth and with all the company of heaven, we worship and adore your glorious name. Most righteous God, we remember in this supper the perfect sacrifice offered once on the cross by our Lord Jesus Christ for the sin of the whole world. In the joy of his resurrection and in the expectation of his coming again, we offer ourselves to you as holy and living sacrifices. Send your Holy Spirit upon us, we pray, that the bread which we break and the cup which we bless may be to us the communion of the body and the blood of Christ. Grant that being joined together in him, we may attain to the unity of the faith and grow up in all things into Christ our Lord. And as this grain has been gathered from many fields into one loaf, and these grapes from many hills into one cup, grant, O Lord, that your whole church may soon be gathered from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Amen. On the same night when he was betrayed, Jesus took his disciples and he sat with them And he broke bread and he gave thanks and he gave it to them and said, Take and eat. This is my body broken for you. This do as often as you eat it in remembrance of me. And later that same night after they had eaten, Jesus took the cup and he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me.
Brothers and sisters in Christ, the bread which we break is a communion of the body of Christ. Take and eat.
cup of blessing which we bless is the communion of the blood of Christ. Drink it in remembrance of him. Let us pray. O oh, gracious and God, good God, we give you thanks for this great blessing. This great blessing of being able to share this meal together. May we go forth in its joy. And may we live in the freedom that it gives us in you to live for you, to love you with all of our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please rise for God's blessing. Brothers and sisters in Christ, go forth in the joy, in the freedom, knowing that you are forgiven. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the presence and power of the Holy Spirit go with you. And all of God's people said, Amen. Oh, how he loves you and me.